I'll try to... should do some blues. I should have cut my fingernails. I can't even play with my fingernails all long. I like to grow my fingernails long. should have warmed up. I didn't know we were going to do this. I would have warmed up on the guitar. I can't even play right now. Don't, don't sweat it. We don't have to do anything. Or I'm, we sweating, can just I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Just because you are not paranoid doesn't mean that you are not coming here. I am here. 
You... I'm right here. Oh, oh, the presence is amazing. I have to say. What's up, Orr? To me, baby. Are you not, baby? Oh, yeah! All right! <laughs> we are down here, we are down here, and we are, uh, we are doing some live iron for you tonight here on a Thursday night. Live! Do it. All right! On Fringe! On oh, yeah! Come on! Yeah! On the Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. We are live. I gotta give a shout out. Yeah. Hey, Bellas. Right. Hey, who's that shout yeah. out? To? Who? To who? Katie Bowley. Katie Bowley. One of my good, good buddies, and she's actually listening. All right, Katie. Oh, yeah. Oh. Ooh, that was nice. Text me if you hear me, girl. Oh, man. Dude, that one, like, I, I'm telling you, when you, when you did that just now, I felt so special. Oh dear. Chills went up and down my spine. Did you get a tingle up the back of your leg like Chris Matthews? Yeah, get some! (laughs) Well, my socks went up and down just by the hairs alone pushing them. Oh dear. (laughs) What's up? Oh yeah! All right, we are. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. We are live with Counselor Mark on a Thursday night, 7 p.m. Cent, uh, Pacific. Ah, ah. 7 p.m. Pacific, uh, 8 p.m. Central. No, 7 p.m. <laughs> 7 p.m. Pacific. 7, 7, 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central. 9 and p.m. Central. It's 9:20. So yeah, we're late. Don't set your clock by us. Yeah, producer Rick, he uh, started everything 15 minutes late. So we're, the whole lineup, Douglas Hamp, and Lynn Marzio, the Accelerations Radio, and the Iron Show are all about 15 minutes late. And uh, so it's uh, so remember, Thursday nights, not every Thursday, because <laughs> my life is so wild. But some Thursday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, <laughs> 8 p.m. Counselor Mark! Oh, yeah! 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, right? And 10 p.m. in New York City! Oh, yeah! <laughs> I love to say that. What? Uh, 10 p.m. in New York City! Okay, New baby. York City! Oh, yeah, baby! Oh! All right. So, uh, here we are tonight, and... I'm, t- I'm texting with Katie right now. Oh. She's like my bestest buddy oh. in the whole world at this moment besides you. I didn't know. Johnny t- McMahon. I didn't know. I love te- her. I love you, Katie. I didn't know texting was allowed on the Iron Show. I can text if I want to. Oh, yeah, baby. You are Counselor Mark. Counselor Mark does what he wants. Drop my pick. Oh, my pick. I dropped my pick. I have to yeah. play with my band aid. Yeah, I have to tell everybody that's listening that Counselor Mark is a little off of his medication. I'll put down my guitar. And so I'm a little wound up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm well, this should be an interesting up. one for my peeps. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am you down with it. that, man. You know I am, dude, I am all the way live with that, baby. Oh my gosh, I can't believe the way the last two weeks have been. I've been sliding slowly down this little precipice into this chasm of just stupid wound up. You know, there's no way great, out. Man. There's no way out, Counselor Mark. Oh, yeah, there oh, is. Only <laughs> Jesus. There's no way out in this world. Only Jesus is your answer. That's right. You Absolutely cannot. right. Jesus is Absolutely. your only answer. You know uh I got to give a shout out. There's a there's a boy, you know, out there that I got to give a shout out to myself. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. I ain't the only one. Uh, let me see here. Uh, let me find that boy. Oh, here he is. Oh, yeah. We got to find him. I got to give a shout out to him. Tim Carroll. My brother, Tim Carroll. 
He is down in, uh, let me see, where is he? I forgot where he's at. Oh, Charleston. Charleston, South Carolina, baby. Oh, that's the birthplace <laughs> oh. of Counselor Mark. Hi, Tim. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, that was a good one. Hey, I speak- know, and I didn't even have the delay on. Let me do it again. Oh, oh, Let me yes, get some delay and reverb yeah. on it. Yeah. Are, are we oh, echoey oh, yet? Yeah, are we echoey? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah. Heck oh, yeah, I did it. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, man. Oh, oh ju- no. Dude, my ch- I, I think I felt it move. Okay, no. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, oh, I always. Balls. Oh, yeah. What's up? Oh, yeah. I think it moved again. Okay, I always go too far. That's my that's, that's my like Scottish theme. man, yeah. dude. That's, that's like it. my that's, that's like my, my soul. That's like my Scottish, you know. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I think you have on your kilt, laddie, because we're going for the ride. You know, I had it hard when I was a kid. Five and <laughs> twenty of us in a in a cardboard box in the middle of the street. Every morning uh-huh. we'd have to get up, clean the box, go to work at mill, pay mill owner twenty. Pence for the privilege of working there. We get home, our dads had murder us in cold blood, and dents about our graves, singing "Hallelujah, he's dead, he's dead." Ah, uh, sucks <laughs> to be Scottish, don't it, lad? Oh, yeah. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> Mark had it rough when he was a kid. Talking about five and twenty of his family live at the bottom of the lock. Every morning, they'd have to get up, clean the lock. They'd go to work at mill, 23 hours, pay mill owner for the privilege of working there. And they'd get home and their dads had beat them about the head and neck with a broken bottle. <laughs> it didn't toughen you up, lad. <laughs> you cannot do it unless you do it, right? <laughs> hey, that was good. I like this. You're doing better than me tonight. I'm telling you what, man. Uh, I'm on it. No, I, like, I got a Scottish character that I like to run out every now and then, you know, because I, I can do the Scottish accent better than my Australia accent and stuff. And it's like, oh, what are you looking at, huh? Yeah, I'll slap you upside your head. That's what I'll do. I'll do it. I dare you just to spite me. <laughs> you are like so much better at me than that. Hey, oh, am- I'm so wound up. Oh, man, I'm ex- is, like wound up like I'm wound up. I'm puffing in the mic tonight because I, I pulled the foamy, fuzzy ball off my microphone and I lost it and I got to go buy another one. So I'm puffing in the mic tonight. Mr. Peepop. So you'll have to forgive me. and Johnny. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. I got to back up. And back. I'm like, well, I turn the gain up, right, and just back off here. Yeah, I'll turn the gain go. up and just back off. There's there we go. There's a little bit of filter okay. on the mic. Yeah. Something. Yeah, a there's little that little screenily bob there. Yeah, yeah, a little um, screen. A little screenly little bob. A little screenly Wind bob. It up a little bit. <laughs> Scrub it up. You know. Scrub it up. Scrub you know it up. Me messed up, man. Oh. We're Everybody talk was. About it tonight. We were getting real with the boys we're the other talk night. We're about it tonight. This is what's got me messed up. I went and saw the Noah movie. Oh, I did too, yeah. Oh, laddie, that's what did it. It My did it My head was you. fine, and then I saw Noah, and it <laughs> screwed me up, lad. And I walked out, and I thought. That was the biggest piece of oh, yeah. crap I've ever watched. <laughs> it's like the worst movie ever. I was, I'm going to do the entire show in his accent. I wanted it to st- end. <laughs> well, when I'm watching these these cave stone looking things, you know, that are shaped like proto Hebrew letters. Exploding, they're just they're their life force just cracking right out and then heading for the ski. It was it was unreal, man. I'm sitting there shaking in my popcorn. I was like, oh, look at that. They got stone guys that are all full of glowy stuff. Who wrote this piece of trash? <laughs> <laughs> there was some now I would like in, in the defense. You know, laddie. <laughs> Ah, oh, the piece of Noah trash movie. 
<laughs> Most people don't even know it was a boot, but it was about Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism. Those people are out of their minds. But most people didn't know because Madonna's not a very good evangelist of Kabbalah. <laughs> and Britney Spears, she's actually a really oh. good evangelist of anything, actually. That girl is me. like, like, you cry, like Britney? Quiet for, for a beating. Britney Spears, I'll take her bald. No problem. Take her where, lad? <laughs> to the dog track? <laughs> Actually, you better Brit- run for your supper. Britney Spears, you know, everybody always, when she was a big star, everybody thought she was so hot and sexy. But I actually yeah. thought she was a really good songwriter and a really good performer. I liked her voice, and I thought she was a really talented artist myself. I mean, I know that's, like, unpopular to say that. But I wrote her an email about that. I said, you know, everybody thinks you're such a hot babe, but I, like, think you're a really good artist. I think you got a lot of a lot of really raw talent. And she wrote me an email back. She's like, thanks, Johnny. So that's why. <laughs> well, there you go, lad. Did you see up with the day? No, it was a thank you. Uh, just a thank you, lad. It was oh, nothing was more than that. A wee a bit of love. Nothing just more a wee than that. Thank you. I got a lousy thank you from Brittany. A soul of God was a lousy thank you. <laughs> you know, and people thank me a lot, you know, because, like, I'm – Good. I'm like at my job. I'm good at what I do, and I get people done fast, and they're grateful. Well, you're good looking, you know, yeah. male prostitutes. I'm, so, I'm so pretty, but um, people That's thank me so a lot. And pretty. what I usually say is, you know, th- what can I thank you? What can I buy with thank you? Give me some money. You know, can I go to Starbucks and buy a triple latte, soy latte, um, you know, caramel macchiato with a thank you? No, no, I can't. Good lad. Can I take Best your thank you? On. Can I take your thank you and go buy me a hamburger? No. Yeah. No. We'll have no hamburger. <laughs> None. Can I walk up to all. the counter and say thank you and hope I get a burger? That's it. What's your thank you? Get me a bag of haggis? <laughs> no. No. I got nothing. None. No. I got nothing. None. Yeah, better off Not deed. A- I'm better off deed. Yeah, I'm better off deed. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, uh, Cruzy from uh, <laughs> Cruzy from the old Future Quake South Africa, which is now Like Flint Radio, which awesome. I got to give a shout out to those people, right? Shout. What's <laughs> up? But Cruzy says, What's if <laughs> if you think that nobody cares if you're alive or dead, try missing a few payments. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if you're squatting in there, laddie. You got to get out of my house. <laughs> yeah, get out of the house, you know. Except if you're listening. Except if you're listening to the Iron Show, then you got to have us live. So uh, That's right. What, what's Rick the doing? live iron. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, producer <laughs> Rick just told me to hit it. I was He did, He, he said he wasn't getting me a, key, a cue, but I was – Counselor Mark was listening to Pastor <laughs> Lynn. Acceleration. Hey, I went, I went down to L.A. and hung out with Gonzo and Basil and uh, all the guys, you know, down there and um, Pastor Lynn and man, it was really cool. At the end, Pastor Lynn gave his presentation, you know, and uh, at the end though, he goes, you know, because you know what Pastor Lynn's into Nephilim and the, like the the Great Deception and all that stuff. It was really cool. But at the end, Pastor Lynn goes, "Look, I'm done with this. Let's let's." Let's get real here. And he goes, he sits down, you know, on the stage and he goes, everybody, you know, I'd like to um, pray to the, for the Holy Spirit to come in here and, you know, give us a word of prophecy and stuff. And dude, it was like an old school Pentecostal Holy Spirit experience, man. It was like, he's a really good, see, nobody calls him Pastor Lynn, but Johnny and man, those people in that, in that auditorium, when that happened, now they know why Johnny calls him Pastor Lynn. It was some serious dude. It was weird. I closed my eyes when we were praying and stuff, and I saw all white behind my eyelids, just pure white, like a white snowy blanket. And anyway, you know, he was asking for words of prophecy, and people were speaking some really cool stuff from the Holy Spirit. And but uh, after it was over, I. Uh, everybody was talking about it and you know all the lights were up and pastor lynn was gone and and like everybody behind me like in the last in the three rows behind me they all saw the same white when they closed their eyes and i was like whoa and they're like oh yeah 
I like that. I like that spirit filled stuff. I'm really into that. That's where I came from. You know, I was, re- I was saved in a snake bite Pentecostal church, you know, people foaming <laughs> at the mouth, and <laughs> twitching all over the floor, <laughs> snakes hanging off their arms. <laughs> <laughs> Twitching like a tweaker. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. man, that is some love. Oh, dude. Well, I'll tell you what, I grew up so in a church good. that was kind of Pentecostal. So we had some stuff going on. I was real familiar with it. And I just thought, well, you know, it's uh, you probably won't ever catch Mark cutting a rug, you know, in the spirit. But uh, stuff like that, experiences like that, man, they just they nail it into your brain. You know, you're somewhere – and the Holy Spirit's there too, and it changes you. You don't you don't come away from stuff like that without having it stuck in your head and making a difference. Yeah, you know, um, I remember when I was um, a new Christian, probably, man, I'm not even a year into it, and uh, my mentor Louis Louis Knutson, he says, you know, we got to get you to. He was a hardcore snake bite Pentecostal dude. He said, you know, we got to get you to one of them camp meetings. And I was like, camp meetings? He's telling me all about it. Anybody who doesn't know, camp meetings are like Pentecostals, like, gather in the forest, you know. And they usually, you know, usually there's, like, this huge cabin or something. Or, like, they all hang out around some, in some gully, you know. And the, the pastor's, you know, at the bottom of the gully with the PA system. And they're all hanging out in the forest and camping out. And uh, anyway, um but this one, it was a gigantic log cabin auditorium. I mean, it was huge. I mean, it was like... Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, it was the trippiest thing. I don't even know if it's still there, but it was back in 1985. It was this huge auditorium, but it was all a log cabin. And it was as big as a big opera hall. It was really incredible. Anyway, I was in the back. And this old, old, old school, old guy. I mean, he's like 85 years old or 90 or something. He was like the last speaker, and this dude was like totally, totally um, old school preacher, just old school. And it was just such a experience to hang out with that guy, to to listen to that guy. And at the end, he goes, uh, but he starts praying for the Holy Spirit to come on, come on the group, you know, to come huh. into the auditorium, you know. And he's praying, and he starts praying in tongues. And man, I was tripping out. And but see, I didn't really believe really in. The Holy Spirit, you know, um, actually, you know, I thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of, they were got really enthusiastic and kind of faked it and stuff when they fell over and stuff, you know, how they'd hit him on the forehead and they'd fall over and, you know, twitch on the floor. (laughs) I thought that was like, well, everybody's kind of playing the game. It's not really, I mean, I believe in the Holy Spirit and the miracles and everything at that point, you know, I did, but I didn't really think it was like really real when the Holy Spirit would like hit you and knock you down and. All of a sudden, he just goes, bam, with his hands. I give you the spirit. And he goes, bam, with his hands. And the I started, you know, it was like a domino effect. The whole auditorium, they were falling down row by row by row, getting closer and closer to me. And I was standing up, and I was, you know, standing up and flexing my muscles like, this isn't going to get me. No way, you know. I'm like, Rrr! You know, and it, it hits. It finally gets to my row. It hits me. I'm telling you what, man. It was like a ton of bricks. It knocked me flat on my sorry ass, and it felt, dude. It was the most incredible Holy Spirit encounter I ever had. Wow. It felt like I was floating in a hot tub on an overdose of painkillers. That's with, crazy. I've with, never had anything like that. I have a dude, totally different story. I'm at a place. I was a believer I, then. I was totally uh, a believer. Well, I, I mean. I got saved when I was nine. I, oh, I know. I've been around everything, and and I was at this Jesus Music Festival, big old, you know, fifty thousand people are there, and they got huge stage and tents and stuff, and for four days they're doing nothing but cranking Christian rock and stuff. And anyways, I'm hanging around the sound because I'm a geek. I'm hanging around the sound booth, and a piece of the scaffolding fell off and hit me in the shoulder. Oh man. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and and I, I was having me oh, some Mike man. Warnke luck right there oh, for a minute, whoa. and so it was a small piece, thank the Lord. And so I thought, you know what? They're doing healing over in the tent over there. I'll just go over there. I, that's how automatic my thinking was. I was like, God heals. They're doing healing. I'm going to go over there and get healed. So I went over there, and I sat and listened to the guy preach. And I'm, you know, everybody's in this tent sweating like crazy because it's Orlando, Florida, and. uh and so he's like, anybody who wants to get prayed for, feel the Holy Spirit, get healed, nah, 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 come back here behind the stage and we'll all hold hands and line up. 
And I'm standing in the middle. Now, I am a 12-year-old kid, right? And I'm standing in the middle of this big old group. And he lays hands on the first couple people, and it's like dominoes. Just boom, boom, boom. And everybody's holding hands. And I'm in the middle. And I kid you not, dude, it went right by me. Everybody was laid out but me. <laughs> oh, no! And he was looking at me like I had horns <laughs> hey, growing then. out of my head. We got a heathen amongst us. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding, man. <laughs> they were all kind of like, what? Where's the mass hysteria? You're supposed to fall out. Yeah. And I just was standing there. I was like, I didn't get healed. I didn't fall over. Man, I'm getting gypped. So I went to my pastor, and I'm like, dude, I don't get it. And he was like, well, sometimes it happens, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you get healed, and sometimes you don't. Read the book of Job. Now get out of here. Yeah. So I was like, all yeah. right, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. And these healing experiences, like Peter Goodgame, he goes out and heals people, you know, in the street and gas stations in the park and in his healing rooms. He's got a healing rooms every other week, and people come in there, yeah, and sometimes they get healed, sometimes they don't. He's take, he says it takes a lot of guts because – it doesn't always, you know, God doesn't always want to heal somebody at that moment. He might want to heal them later, too. He says a lot of times you'll, like, be praying for somebody to be healed, and nothing happens, and they'll call you a month later and say, like, I woke up and I'm totally normal. So, wow. yeah, you don't know. You don't know. You just got to be bold and kind of. Yeah, and the thing is, is the thing that God is most concerned with about us as believers is our the condition of our heart, the condition of our spirit. And so if he's got to use physical pain to continue to keep us in line to get those other parts fixed first, he'll do it. He's got a plan. Yeah, and he's if, got yeah. a plan. He says what – did, what did he say? He said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are as high above your thoughts as the clouds are above the grass of the field. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand and there God's is, ways at all. And, I, and yeah. I, to, to tell you the truth, if you – dropped in to share it with me like like you know hey this is how i know something bam my head had just explode i wouldn't have a clue i, I wouldn't understand it i go could you explain that again <laughs> <laughs> would you please wipe up my drool <laughs> yeah it's like <laughs> could you amplify my brain so i could at least get three or four parts of that even I want to put in pop. <laughs> could you give me some um, rubber gloves so I could grasp that oh, a little bit there? Yeah, I mean, seriously. I, I, <laughs> God's amazing, dude. And I've had some real interesting experiences like you lately where I've just been in the presence of God. And most of it's just I went on vacation. I went down to Florida to see my peeps. And I went out to – I love to go out to the beach at night. And me and a friend, he had just re- read a book by uh, – going to come to me it's a systematic theology by norman geisler and uh and he'd never read anything like this ever before and when i was going through my master's programs i had to read a bunch of stuff like that so we talked about god for three hours and it was like we totally worshiped god with our brains and the waves are crashing and the stars are out and it's just immense and you think about the fact that god put us here created us uniquely and wants to relate to us. And then he puts on this display that no other being in the universe could possibly even begin to match. They might as well cover your head with a trash bag and poke holes in it and call them stars. Yeah. Nothing comes close. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. And a lot of times, um, you know, me and Peter Goodgame were hanging out talking about the supernatural. And, you know, a lot of the supernatural, it, you know, supernatural, that's God's domain. You know, the Satan, he tries, he hijacks that and tries to make a bad fake of it, you know, or it's real, but it's just not very good. And then everybody labels supernatural stuff, you know, like signs and wonders and healing. They try to lab- they try to name that after the devil. And that's just yeah. crazy. That's crazy talk. I don't get it. I don't get God, that. It's just like the Pharisees back in the day, man. They can't take it. They they can't they can't deal with it if it's something. And there's a lot of churches that are like this, and I feel bad for them. There's you know I I go to a pretty laid back church. We pray for people's healings, but we're not tripping. You know nobody's looking for the for the snakes or nothing. But but the thing is is I believe it because I know he does it. He's I mean. He's healed me on the inside like he heals people on the outside. And so these churches are just so afraid of losing control. They're so afraid of getting uncomfortable. They're so afraid of being touched by the Spirit 
that they're so stodgy, you know, and they're so rigid and stuck and it's so hard for them. And I, I don't mock them. I don't ridicule them. I don't, I have nothing but sympathy yeah. for these groups of people and for the people that follow the pastors who lead these churches because they are not getting to feel the awesomeness that is the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Dude, it's they, inc- they're, they're, they're terrified. It's incredible when the Holy Spirit really wants to kick on you. It is the most incredible thing. There is no drug that comes even close no. to that. When, when That's you, the when gospel you are, truth there. When the anointing comes down on you, there is nothing at all ever like it. No. And I've had that happen to me a few times. I'll tell you what, man. I just I weep like Isaiah, dude. When I when I feel the presence of God, I am undone. Oh yeah. Just undone. Yeah, so. what it, what undoes me is uh you know, um okay, this verse. But he was from Isaiah, the fifth gospel, they call it. But yeah. he but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Oh yeah, baby. That's it. That's it right That's there. The prophecy. That's it. That's some hardcore, dramatic, deep core theology right there, baby. Yep. That's it. That's By his stripes, prophecy. we are healed. You know, a lot of people don't know what that means. The stripes are the whip marks from the yeah. uh, Roman whips across his body. Stripes. See, my, my mom blood. tried to ruin that in me because oh, no. she was so psycho that she would spank me with a, a stick, you know. So she'd wail on me for a bit, and then she'd say, well, Mark, by your stripes, you're healed. Oh, God. Oh, oh brother. Is that like – That's brutal. That's, that's, that's like – You know thing. what that is? That is a anthropocentric soteriology. <laughs> Dude, I don't know where you took that out from, but – It's right, isn't it? Pull it out, man. Anthropomorphic soteriology. No, anthro- anthropocentric. <laughs> Yeah, so, soteriology. What, what the anthropocentric? Didn't know the word, lot. I didn't know the word. Anthropo- <laughs> anthropocentric is man-centered, and soteri- soteriology is salvation. S- savior, yeah, salvation. By your stripes, you are healed. Anthropocentric soteriology. That's wow, brutal. man, I'm proud of you, dude. Dude, you got to hear words like that from a longshoreman. You people out there that don't know those words, you should be ashamed of yourself. Having a low down. <laughs> Longshoreman. Oh my Dude. gosh! A man who walks around with a steel Playing hook that. in his hand for hours. <laughs> hey, he um, knows the word anthropo something. Anthropocentric. Anthropo. I'm so used to hearing anthropomorphic. Yeah, I can't get anthropocentric out of my you head. Just did it, know, baby. You mouth. just did it. I've I got it, it on anthropocentric soteriology. Yep. Oh, I, wow. Oh, yeah. I got it on yeah, So for you people out there that hear the word soteriology, it is the fancy word for the study of salvation. Yes. And we have to have a Christ centered soteriology. Yeah. You know, that the has world, to be our th- theology that only Jesus saves only him. Yeah. You have no hope outside him, you know, and the world preaches a man centered Soteriology, really. I mean, really. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, our science is a man centered soteriology. Oh, my goodness. Especially, they really honestly believe that it's going to save us. Just thinking we know things, thinking that we know the, the you know, you, we've never even seen an atom. No. I mean, we don't even know what one looks like. It's all theory, and yet we're telling people. How the entire universe was created. <laughs> yeah. And we've never even seen not even the smallest parts. We're like No, we don't know how halfway down there. We ain't got no clue. No, we've got no, we've got atoms and below that we've got what they're made of, protons, neutrons, electrons. Below that we've got quarks. We've identified all of them by now. Top, bottom, left, right, charm, love. Yeah, they have to name them by like tort- sort of uh, ent- ghostly entity names, emotional names, because they really they don't behave like like material. They behave like like entities. Yeah, they're like yeah. ghosts. They're energy. They're vibrating energy. Below that, 
smaller strings. The smallest we've gotten, the best we can tell, they're just little bends in space time. There's just like nothing there. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, and so the whole world is like, you know, Paul said that the world is a cheap imitation of heaven. Huh. Did you know that? Yep. Yep. So, so I think that my little theory is, is that the whole world here, it's real, it's reality, and Jesus' blood was real, but, um, it was, Jesus' blood was more real than this reality, because heaven is the real solid substance of reality. That's my little know, theory, but that, I don't know. Well, I know I, my thoughts on, uh, on, you know, like the glorified Christ was the reason why he was able to pass through walls was because he was more real than the walls. Exactly. Cause the walls are, there's so much empty space in a wall. Well, I mean, you just think about the reality of all of the spirit and all of the flesh combined into this glorious Christ who does anything he wants to, anything. I mean, I, I don't understand why people don't just think about that and uh, start thinking real seriously about adopting the idea that Jesus is Lord and that's the best thing for us. It is too. Well, I think pe- people, they think about what they have to give up. And, oh, ain't that the truth? Uh, it is. I mean, that's the big thing. I know it, when you come to Jesus, I know a lot, there's a lot of the flesh that's fighting it because it's thinking that it has to sell itself out and it doesn't want to sell out. But, you know, the thing is, is that Jesus has more for you than the world does anyway. So it's not like you're going to give it up. You're not giving up anything. No. It's all gain. Yep. And uh, I'm trying to think of who said it, and I'm trying to get the saying right, but it was something to the effect of, why would I cling to the thing I can't keep? Uh, yeah. Can't you know take what I'm talking you. about. Can't take it with you, baby. Can't take yeah, it with you. Yeah, he was talking about, uh, you know, taking hold of the permanence of God and letting go of all the things he can't keep anyways. Yeah, your life is like, what did that one poet say? Life is like a... Pipe full of tobacco, and destiny wipes us out like ashes. <laughs> <laughs> you got to say it like a Scotsman there, laddie. No, he life was English. Is like a, what, life the, is like uh, a pot full of tobacco. The, it wipes us out like ash. It was like the, the, Earl, destiny. the <laughs> Earl of... <laughs> The Earl of, I like the Earl of Duganshire or Hamptonshire, who once said, I'm so glad I was not born before tea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Yeah, that's funny, man. <laughs> so so you go on this trip, you go down to the Prophecy Conference, you finally get to hang out with Rick. What is Rick really like? I love Rick, man. It's just like... So we go. So I go to his place. You know, he lives in Oceanside, which is like super paradise. Palm trees, you know, bikini girls. You know, everybody's driving a hundred miles an hour. You know, in the twenty-five <laughs> mile an hour. Zone. That's awesome. That's what you want, right there. I love it, baby. I love the All traffic. All kinds of beautiful things to see, and you're going so fast you can't see it. Yeah, that is paradise. And you get you get to a stop sign, you better watch out. You better watch it. You know, you're going to get hammered, but, uh, no, I go to, so I go to his place. He's got a, he's got a really nice, I mean, it's not nice, not fancy. It's just a nice for a poor person like me. It's better than where I live. He's got a double wide trailer in a trailer court. And, uh, but God, there's, he's got, he's got two orange trees and a lemon tree in his backyard, just full of oranges and lemons. He's got lemons bigger than grapefruits. But so anyway, I go in there and he comes out and we hug each other, you know, and shake hands and stuff. And we're standing there kind of looking at you like, what's up? What's up? And we're standing there looking at each other for a while. And he's got this weird look on his face. I go, this is really awkward, isn't it? He goes, yeah, actually it is. I go, you want me to, I go, you want me to kick your ass? Would you feel better? Break the ice a little bit? (laughs) 
<laughs> we start busting up laughing. I spent oh, five man. days with you know my co-host Rick, met him in person for the first time, and we just we just hung out. It was great. We had a great time. We, there was one night we drank too much wine and almost got in a fist fight, and it was great. I loved every minute of it. I just, absolutely, Rick. I love Rick, man. I'm, you know, he's just like. There was, you know, I've known him, we've done the show together for like five, six years, and there was no difference being with him in person. It was just better. It was just because yeah. I could hang out with That's him. That's really and, cool. Yeah, it was great. But Sometimes sh- I got to make the big trip out to the West Coast so I can hang out with my boy Johnny. Yeah, you can hang out in the trailer and you can sleep on the couch, sort of. I ain't sleeping on no couch. You can have my bed, I'll sleep on the couch. You got that right. But you better not pee the bed. I don't like pee uh, the bed, man. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the the water boy. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> I think your old boy is sexy. His mama mama says, "Oh yeah, you think that's sexy?" Points at that shirt waving in the wind with a big <laughs> pee stain on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I gotta give a shout out to my girl Katie again. Hey, her dad and I were stationed in Korea together, and. I used to do this Scottish accent that I'm doing for you tonight all the time out there. And this guy, I'm not kidding, not anymore because, you know, we're old. But back in the day, I remember the first time I saw him, I walked into the room that he was working in and I looked at him. I was like, oh, you're friggin' huge. And the guy's like 6'4". And it's like if they didn't get Chris Evans to play Captain America, this guy could have played Captain America. He's just massive. You know, he probably lifts up whole engine blocks and stuff. Total motorhead. Super cool guy. I taught him to play bass. Well, uh, his stepdaughter is uh, on doing the text thing with me just a little bit and listening to the show. And she was like, uh, <laughs> Mike said you used to do that Scottish accent in Korea. So, yeah, I, did, I was doing that stupidity all the way back then. But, you know, so speaking of the past. But, yeah, I got to get out to the West Coast, man. I haven't been in L.A. for – Oh, 30 years. Oh, what it's you... been just crazy. And of course, up your way in Oregon. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I've yeah. never been up there. I got to get up there. Really? You never been to Portland? I have passed through Seattle, and that's as close. That's kind of like Seattle, smaller. Looks like Seattle, uh-huh. only smaller. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the West Coast, and the what did Jim Morrison say? He said it best. The West is the best. You get here, we'll do the rest. Right, Jim Morrison. Oh yeah, baby. That guy was a clown. <laughs> he was. He was my um. Though he was my lyrical hero. Um, my the bass player. I used to be in a band called Avant Garde. Avant Garde, and uh, the bass player Lindsay. Um, forced me to listen to uh, just about everything the Doors had ever done. And then he would read uh, poetry books by Jim Morrison to me. And uh, he just forced that stuff into me. And Jim Mor- I just wanted to be like – I wanted to write lyrics like Jim Morrison because he was like one of the great, um, greatest American poets I think that ever lived. You know? Uh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you about heartache and the loss of God. Hopelessly wandering in endless darkness. Out here on the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we are stoned, immaculate. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man. I just wanted my lyrics were like uh, Jim Morrison. and uh, I mean, cool. they weren't like Jim Morrison. They were like me, but I just, you know, I was so gr- I'm so grateful that Lindsay forced that Jim Morrison down my throat for like my my formative years, 16, 17, 18. It's was, it was like when I started writing lyrics, I had something to, you know, I wanted to, I want, he was my hero. I wanted to write cool lyrics like him, but um, me and Lindsay. A lot of people don't know how old Johnny the Longshoreman is. So this is back when you were like opening for Buddy Holly, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's up? Well, kind of, we were going to talk about Noah, but I wanted to talk about this because Counselor Mark doesn't know anything yeah. about my my latest adventure with Peter Goodgame. I hung out with Peter Goodgame in person, and we went on a pilgrimage. But uh, Counselor Mark doesn't know all the backstory about this, so I'm going to set this up. I want to have Counselor Mark mute his mic, but listen, 
Um, back in back in 1981, um, Avant Garde first formed when Johnny, who back then uh, my name was Marin Keith, and uh, my daughter got named after my stage name. So this is back when Marin Keith, uh, Cookie Crane, and Snake Pigman first met. Cookie Crane was a guitar player. And we met in a, a garage in 1981, early 1981. And by 1982, we had formed Avant Garde, and we were pr- writing songs. We didn't play any covers. It was just all original. So anyway, uh, uh, by 1983, we were performing, and uh, we got picked up by um, Calhoun Production. We got signed by Calhoun Productions, who was like our biggest fan. He was always in the in the in the crowd yelling and screaming, which is kind of weird to have your producer as your biggest fan. And he was showcasing us. We were playing big halls, but uh, this is a this is a song that we wrote. It's called Caves, and it's in. Uh, I'm I'm singing, and uh, Kirky, Cookie Crane is the guitar player, uh, Lindsey Burner is the bass player, and Snake Pigman on drums, and we're playing, this is Caves, Avant Garde, live at the Crystal Ballroom in 1983. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, Giant, I, I, I don't know how you hit those notes, man. Dude. Dude, I'm I guess, serious. I was the master of the full volume <laughs> uh, falsetto Ooh. highs, man. I just nailed them things, man. <laughs> who, who was your vocal inspiration That's for what, that stuff, man? I, I don't know, man. That's one. We, you know, there's a. I'll play another song later, our theme song to Avant Garde. But um, there was one line in there, and it went uh, walls and chrome balls, sterile tone, mushrooms. In fields, left alone, on their own. And that's what we were. We kind of, that was our mission as far as being a band, is that we were the mushrooms in fields, left alone. We were the ones that weren't exposed to other music, you know, other styles. We wanted to try to create our own thing. And when we finally came out of the garage, you know, and were performing, people would be coming up to us after the show going, man, I never heard anything like that. And we're like, what, where did you, what, it's like this and that and this, and I can't describe it. And we're like, cool, thanks, man. Because that was our greatest compliment that we were, you know, they, they were original, you know. And that yeah. was my thing. I wanted to be totally, I wanted to be like the vocalist that they found in the circus <laughs> sideshow and said, hey, man, you want to be in our band? <laughs> Yeah, just stunned over there next to the chick with the beard. <laughs> My favorite part in that song, Caves on Stage, man. I just love that so much. It's like when Kurt Kirk would go, and I'd go, ah, and Kurt would go, ah. He was, you, know, you know, doing the double, you know, the double string, yeah. you know, you know, riffs. And I'd lean up against him. We'd lean up against each other. He'd go, I just love doing That's that. Cool. It was so cool on stage. You should have seen it. It was really cool. We worked on it a lot, you know. And everybody would be screaming. I was like, <laughs> it looked really cool. We had wow, that act man. down really cool. And, uh, man. So, anyway, um, okay. So, let's, let's fast forward here 30 years. Johnny, uh, a few months ago, I almost, I accidentally ki- almost killed myself. I was working on a project, and I tell you, really want to tell you all the details, but um, I just really cut myself bad, and I was ble- I was bleeding bad on the trailer floor, you know, and I was having a really hard time. I was going through some stuff. I'm gonna tell you what, and this thought crossed my mind. It was like, oh God, well, I gotta go to the hospital, or what do I do? What do I do? I gotta do something fast, you know. And I'm thinking, then this thought crossed my mind. It's like. Why don't I just relax and just bleed out and let it happen? You know, and uh Golly. And it was right That's then. That's dark, dude. Dude, I know it was dark. And uh right then, at that right as that thought happened, uh, the blood was pooling up on the trailer floor. I looked up at this poster, I'll put it in the show notes. I made a poster of me and Cookie Crane on stage. And I'm uh I'm not singing at the time, I'm doing the I'm doing the sacred stone dance. And uh, it's really, it's pretty. I think it's pretty cool. Look at I'm shaking my head. My hair is flying all around. Cookie Crane's jamming on his V. And I look up at that poster, and I'm like, "That's it. That's my problem. I need to get back on the stage." I started going back. And you know how you do that? You're dying, and you do the fast forward through your life, or the fast rewind, yeah. <laughs> the fast rewind flashback of your life. You were talking about that on one of the Iron yeah. shows. And, the, and, you know, about the human condition, like maybe our fear series or maybe our grief series. That was our fear series. That was. It was our fear series. You were talking about this flashback that happens over your life really fast because your brain just goes into overdrive. And like, oh, big time. And so – so I remember this flashback back to Hey dude, your calls your your vocals kinda of breaking up some now for does, some reason. It doesn't matter because I've got it here. Okay. And, and as long as you're good, as long as you're coming through good, then okay. we are golden. We have nothing but golden Sweet. over here. I didn't want anybody to miss what you had to say. It's all your problem. No, I can't break up. I'm in the studio. How could I possibly break up? <laughs> Okay, I'm going direct into the yeah. recorder. Yeah, I, I get. Yeah, I get. I get what you're saying. Come on, techie Everybody's boy. Everybody's their head like, "What's wrong with that lad? Yeah. He's lost his mind." Come on, techie. You know that. So anyway, uh, 
<laughs> Put him on a little bus. Counselor Mark is a fine musician and a technical genius, so he knows that. You just had to be reminded at the moment there. So uh, I panicked. Actually, he could have explained that to me. So I, sh- I if I would have just waited a few seconds, he would have explained it to me. But anyway, so um, so anyway. This flashback goes back, I'll go, and it occurs to me that I've had nothing but problems since I walked off the stage. So this big revelation hits me. I need to get back on the stage. And then the next revelation that hit me was I got a bottle of super glue in the bathroom. So I ran to the bathroom and I super glued myself shut. And because that's what they do. My brother was telling me that's what they do in emergency room for deep wounds. They super glue it a lot of times. They just pour super glue in there. And you would think that you're like, well, what that kill you or whatever. No, that's what they do. And uh, they use- that's why super glue was invented is to close battlefield wounds. Really? Really? Yeah. It was invented by the army or someone for, for the army to, uh, to close battlefield wounds fast. I used to use it all the time when I worked in a tool and die shop. You can't help but cut yourself like 13 times a day. And we just super glued everything shut. Cool. Cool. So, you know, people who are listening who think that's weird. No, it's, it's not weird to super glue. Actually, no, not some, at all. we may save a life here tonight. Because somebody right, might remember this and super glue themselves back together when they're bleeding out. Yeah, it could happen. Hey, it could happen. You know, you should always carry a super uh, super glue like in your glove box. Have a tube in your bathroom, your medicine cabinet. That's where mine That's was. A good idea. Mine was in the medicine cabinet. I was using it to glue my teeth back together, but um, so anyway. That's another story. Oh, that's <laughs> another story. Well, I'm getting a full upper plate here in about a month, about 30 days from now. I'll have a full upper plate. But anyway, so anyway. It's a collector's plate. Uh, yeah, it's got a picture of plate. Spock and, and No, and it's McCoy. got a picture of Elvis the king, my friend. The king. Speaking of Elvis, man, I used to do the leg shake, the one leg shake, though. I didn't do both legs, but I got that from Elvis on stage. I thought I was so cool. I thought I was too cool for school. I do that. I I wore clogs, high heeled clogs, and I'd do the Elvis thing in my clogs. And yeah, it was cool. <laughs> People screamed, so it must have been halfway cool. But anyway, so well, let's get back to you almost dying. So let's get back to that. So it occurred to me that you know, and I might be wrong. I was thinking, well, I might be wrong. You never know. But I thought I started thinking throughout my life, and everything started mentally and emotionally. Things started going bad when I got off the stage. So it hit me. I said, I thought to myself, looking at that poster, it's like, I got to get back on the stage. So <clears throat> let's fast forward a few months. And here I'm thinking about that. And I'm, I'm playing. I'm like, I'm thinking of all the old guard songs that I could just pull out of memory. I'm trying to play clay at caves. I'm trying to play the sacred stone. I'm trying to pull it out of memory because Cookie Crane, I mean, you can't. You can't sit. It's hard to fill Cookie Crane shoes. But uh, I've, you know, I could probably, I think me and Lindsay can probably do it. But anyway, so, um, so fast forward a couple months and I'm really wanting to get back on stage. I'm really thinking about what I can do to put a band together. And I'd really like, what I really want is to put the guard back together. That's not going to happen because everybody's, you know, that, you know, been hit by an atom bomb and they flew out to different States and countries and stuff. I don't even know where they are or anything. And so anyway, I'm sitting in my car. I get a text message from Peter Goodgame. He says, dude, remember we were, promised to do a pilgrimage to Bethel Church um, in Redding, California. About five years ago, me and you made that deal. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm in, um, I'm in uh, Central California. I'm down in Sacramento, down in Sacktown, Sacktown, baby, uh, visiting my parents, you know, and um, I'll drive up to Redding if you drive down from Portland. And I'm like, dude, okay. So I rented a car and went down there, drove down there to uh, – to Reading, and Peter Goodgame, I met him for the first time in person, and he put me up in this big fancy hotel, and it was like, unbelievable, he paid for everything, and, uh, wow. yeah, and, which is a lot of money for him, he's just a carpenter, 
but um yeah it was like such a deal and man we had the most intense session me and pete went out and hung out all night in a denny's and Oh, man, it was great. We talked about just like everything. We talked about the Antichrist. Because Peter Goodgame, for those who don't know, is the world's authority on the Antichrist. There's like nobody that is knows more than he does. And uh, But anyway, you know, he had an epiphany and, you know, about four years ago and uh, ended up um, leaning towards the charismatic side of the church and and uh, hanging out in Pentecostal churches. And he didn't agree with their theology, all of it, you know, especially their some of their end-time stuff he really had a problem with. And, you know, and the dominionism and stuff, he didn't like that. But the Holy Spirit thing is what got him going. He got hit by the Holy Spirit, and it was all over for him. You know, he was he was hooked, and he became a faith healer and everything. So Bethel Church, for those who don't know, that's like Signs and Wonders Central, not... You know, that's the one, that's the church that has the big target painted on it, you know. And uh, all the all the discernment people, they're really, you know, that's one of their, you know, that's one of their favorite things to pick on, one of their favorite churches. Like the most favorite church to pick on is Bethel. You know, and uh, there's a lot of serious, like, healings and manifestations going on there. And they've got the school, the supernatural, and... And uh, there's all kinds of radical stuff going on there that the discernment people just jump all over, you know. And there's we know a lot of discernment people that hang out in our circles. And so Pete calls me, man. He calls me the uh, the day before. When the, he calls me when I'm driving down there. And uh, he goes, dude, uh, yesterday, man, he goes, I'm, I'm, he goes, I think I got a, a message of prophecy from the Lord. I'm like, yeah? He's going, yeah, you know how things happen through circumstance. I'm like, yeah, what What happened? He goes, well, okay, check this out, dude. He goes, I have an uncle, John. Get it? John. His name's John. I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, he's the wild one in the family. He's the black sheep of the family. He's really wild, right? He's like you. I'm like, whoa, yeah, really? He's like, I go, hey, is that the lumberjack? He goes, yep, that's him. That's him. I was going, oh, whoa. He goes, so I'm with my uncle John, and we're out there hiking in the woods, and we start messing with a, a hornet's nest, and we get stung. He, he got stung in the on the you know under his eye and his eye swelled up. It looked like I, he got hit by a baseball bat when I hooked up with him. <laughs> anyway, he goes. So I get stung with this bee because I'm messing with the hornet's nest. So I think it's a word of prophecy from the Lord telling us not to poke the hornet's nest because we're gonna get stung. Me and not to get there and tell everybody what we did going to Bethel because the discernment freaks will be all over us. <laughs> <laughs> I said, dude, I said, that's not what it means. I go, I feel like I've been, I was laughing and stuff. I go, I feel like I've been anointed as your special interpreter for this prophecy. He's like, uh, yeah, okay. I said, okay, this is what it really means, Pete. I go, we're going to go to Bethel Church. We're going to have this radical encounter. We're going to poke the hornet's nest, and we will get stung. So get ready. <laughs> Wow. So we did. We went. Get it on. Like Dude, Diddy man. Kong. So we go to Bethel Church, right? And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and we're having this radical, it's a radical service, and it is not anything like the discernment people tell about. They must be uh, making stories that got heard from other people that changed it, that changed it, that changed it, and finally you get all this really wild stuff that never happens because this was like a real, real, like normal church. And it was big, and there was a lot of cameras, but it was a lot of really nice, loving people. And the preacher in the morning, he was deaf, and he, you know, spoke with a speech impediment and um, talked about some really good, had a really good message, and it was sound doctrine, nothing weird. And every, nobody was there was weird. They were all nice, regular people. But the band was better than any band I'd ever heard in any church. I mean, these guys were, like, unbelievably talented and uh, just incredible music. You would have, man, you would have loved that part. I was amazed at their band. But anyway, um, afterwards, they said, you know what? Um, We got our prayer team here. We got, you know, 15 or I think it was like 15 people. You know, um, if you need prayer, if you need healing, you know, if you need some kind of uh prophecy you know if you need a word from the spirit he goes come on up front and 
um, we're they're ready to pray for you up there. So um, the preacher, you know, said his goodbye, walked off the stage, and people, a lot, most people left, and some people were, you know, maybe twenty percent of the people, ten percent of the people, were going up to the prayer team up front. Um, for prayer and it wasn't weird like everybody said it was like a bunch of regular people and Pete Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go because I was shy about it I'm really really outgoing I was yelling and stuff during the service and stuff you know I'm one of the you know amen brother preach it and but uh, when it came there's some things I'm really shy about which is weird but I was really shy about that, and Pete literally grabs me and drags me up front. He goes over and he finds the guy to pray for me, brings him over. I'm standing there kind of shaken, scared. I don't know why, but this guy was like, he looked like a truck driver. He was probably a truck driver or a mechanic, just this regular guy. And he comes up to me and he goes, so what what can we pray for you about today? I said, well, I will I want to be equipped for a dream. And he goes, equipped for a dream? He goes, what kind of dream? I go, well, I want to be a singer again. I want to get back up on stage. He goes, oh, we can do that for you. We can do that. Let's get that done. And he puts his hand on my, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he just starts praying. And I can't tell you all the words he's saying because it was just, you know, it's kind of personal, but, you know, um, but, but he, he started praying and asking Jesus to reveal stuff to him and stuff and and uh, help him pray. And, you know, Jesus, please reveal these things things to me about this man. Help, you know, about Johnny and, and uh, so that I can pray better and stuff. And all of a sudden he started um, – his head started shaking and, it, and he started like, whoa, oh, whoa. And it was the exact same reaction as the people – in the front row of one of the avant-garde shows when I was nailing those high notes. Wow. They'd just like, whoa, and they'd shake their head, and they'd kind of, you know, kind of, they'd kind of jump, but flinch. They'd kind of flinch, like somebody was smacking them. (laughs) And the dude was doing, it was the dude I was looking at him, it was the exact same reaction that I'd had when I nailed those high notes in caves. And... It was incredible, and he started, and he said, oh, oh, he goes, he was like, he goes, oh, oh, okay, I see, now I understand, he goes, oh, wow, wow, we've got the real thing here, Jesus, this guy's the real McCoy, he's going, oh, man, he goes, please uh, help him and equip him and, 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 and come into him and, and, and change his voice, come in here and heal his voice, Jesus, so he can sing again, and uh, all of a sudden, I felt this power come into my throat like you can't describe this because it's totally spiritual but it was like this power came into my throat and it was sort of felt like there was these nanobots that were going down through my throat changing them and going down into my upper chest and it felt all this power and it was incredible and all of a sudden i felt i could all these memories flooded back to me what it felt like to be on stage nailing those high notes and um, it was the most incredible experience, dude, I've ever had in my life, short of that Holy Spirit experience where it knocked me on my ass back in 1985. But it was equal to that or better. Wow. It was absolutely supernatural, absolutely incredible. And I walked back, and after I got done singing in rehearsals and on stage, I couldn't speak for a couple days. I could sing still. I could still hit the high notes, but I couldn't talk. I remember I heard Nancy Wilson in an interview, and her voice was just like, ah, 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 ah. and they go, wow, I go, you're such a great singer, you, you can hardly talk. And she goes, yeah, well, I've found that the better my singing voice gets, the worse my talking voice gets. And it was that way for me. I mean, I was just, I couldn't, I was just, just whispers after I'd done a show or a rehearsal. I could still scream though. If you got me back up on that, I could still hit the notes and everything, but I couldn't talk. And when I came back off the, you know, when I came back from the front after that guy prayed for me, I couldn't speak for a couple hours. I was just, it was just like coming off the stage back in 1983. And, uh, so anyway, so we go to the night service. It was really cool. 
And anyway, so we get back. I, mean, I went down with the wife. She wanted to go. So so I get back to Portland, and a couple weeks later, Lindsay, the bass player, pops in from nowhere after 30 years. And I actually I saw him a few years after that. He visited. But it had been 25 years even since I'd even heard from him. And so there's Lindsay on the phone with me. And we started talking, We, you know, and... And uh, then he sends me a text a while later. That's the Rush lyric from 2112. He sends me the test, text from Soliloquy. He just sends me a simple text. He says, the dream is still in, the sleep is still in my eyes. The dream is still in my head. Huh. And I was like, oh, whoa, Lindsay. So, I, so he goes, man, why don't you come over and hang out with me and Mike and my mom? We got this house up. They live across the river in, in Washougal, Washington. That's about 13 miles away, 14 miles away. So I get, I go up and hang out with them. And Lindsay's saying, you know what, man? We got unfinished business with the guard. And I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm blown away because, you know, I'm seeing God put this together now. You know, just with Lindsay was such a miracle. You know, not only seeing him again, but... He left the guard. He was done with it when he left in 83. We blew up like an atom bomb. He was done with the guard. He was done with me. I thought I'd never really see him again in my life. And here he is back in my life saying we got unfinished business with the guard. You know, we need to get back in the studio. So anyway, so anyway, I get, so I was like, man, what about a drummer? You know, I was like thinking and. There's this guy that I met when I was when I met my wife. Uh, we were doing a studio project for a couple of years, for like a year and a half. We were you know rehearsing and then going in the studio. And he's like the best drummer that I've ever heard in my life. Our old drummer Snake was a star. He was very unique, but he was not. He couldn't lace Stephen Poor's boots. He could not lace Stephen Arch Nemesis Poor's boots. There is no way. So. I get a hold of Steve and I said, you know, I haven't seen Steve in 14, 15 years. I get hold of Steve and I go, dude, man, I go, Lind I'm back together with Lindsay and we want to get back in the studio and nail, you know, and, and, and record the, the first album of Avant Garde, you know, revisit the old stuff, rework it, update it. And uh, Steve goes, man, I goes, my, my drums are in my closet. You know, they've been there for years. He goes, I'm not. You know, I was like, I don't drum anymore. And I go, bummer, man. I go, well, if you ever get back into it, let me know. You know, because me and Lindsay are looking for a drummer to record the album. And about two days later, <laughs> Steven gets hold of me. He goes, okay, I got everything set up. He goes, I got all my drums set up. I got, the, I got all the mics set up. He goes, I got my PA. I went out about this. I got one out and bought that. Hey, do you have one of these? Hey, I'm just thinking of getting one of these, but do you have one of those? He goes, hey, what? I got, he goes, everything's set up. Got the rehearsal center set up. Dude, when are we going to go? When are we going to jam? He's like, <gasps> been... <laughs> that's funny. He'd been like camping out for two days solid, putting this whole thing together. It's wow. like no sleep, you know? Or whatever. And I'm like, I'm just slack. Okay, I'm just like slack jot amazed at what's happening right now. So we've got three quarters of the guard back together. And uh, we're just hoping and praying for Cookie Crane. We've been, we've been sending him messages. We've been sending him texts. And he hasn't responded. Lindsay, Lindsay gets hold of me tonight and he goes, man, I... I finally worked up the guts to ask Cookie again, and he goes, I asked him Sunday, I haven't heard anything. He starts making cricket sounds, you know, chirp, chirp, crickets, you know. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But, you know, me and, me and Lindsay, uh, you know, Lindsay, Lindsay was a bass player. Lindsay, in these the last 30 years, has become a pretty good guitar player, and he's got a collection of guitars, and... So he's like, well, me and you can do Cookie's parts, you know. Uh, I said, Steven's a killer, because a good guitar player too, you know, besides being the best drummer in the known universe. I go, so between me and you and Steven, we can record the guitar parts. He's like, yeah, but we're all like, man, even Steven is like, man, we got to get Cookie Crane. We got to get. God, what can we do to make him join? So Lindsay says, you know, let's get some songs recorded. 
you know, let's get something to bring to him. So that's where we that's are right good, now. That's a good idea. Yeah. Is that good psychology? You're a counselor. Yeah, that's a real good idea. I mean, get the songs done as much as you can and take it to him and say, dude, all you got to do is just play and get them stoked on the material. And ultimately, I mean, my goal is to be on stage by September. Wow. That's my goal. I mean, we'll just see. You know, <laughs> you, know you want to make God, la- God laugh? You want to make God laugh? Tell him about all your plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, well, here I'm going to do this, and over here I'm going to do that, and but, I'm going to plant a field and build some barns. And God's like, don't you know? Your soul's going to be required of you tonight. Amen, man. Not the three Dude. ghosts. Not Marley. Not <laughs> You're not going to get visited. You're going to get taken. <laughs> taken. Taken by the Lord. Your soul is, I will require your soul of thee on this oh, very man. night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got this whole plan. We can be in this studio recording the album and then be on stage by September. But I may step out the trailer and get hit by a bus tonight. So who knows? Who knows? But I got to tell you. it sounds cool. It really looks like God is working in this. And you know what? The thing is, is with you being the kind of Christian that you are, uh, you're going to have a great influence over these guys. Yeah, I'm hoping just to be – you know what? I mean um, my goal is not to sing Christian music. My goal is to sing um, music that leads people towards Christ because Uh of the – because it's not – because it introduces them to – well, it gives them an alternative to – Songs about sex, drugs, rock and roll, girlfriends, blah 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 blah. Like yeah. every rock song is about, you know. I mean, I mean, think about yeah. it. I mean, think about it. Avant garde. I mean, what was our, what was our theme song? You know, it was concepts. Uh, you know, um, a man in bald dress, people to impress. He calls his best friend a shiny pet. And the yolk in center, whites on sides, throw it in pan, begins to fry. You know, it's just concepts, ideas, art, and caves. Right. About, it was about cavemen, you know. Yeah. And, and we had a song called The Slave Ship, which was a song against Satan. It was the closest thing to a Christian song we ever had. And I listened to the lyrics, and it, you can tell that I was searching for Jesus. You could really tell. Right. And so... You know, eventually, if the the guys will let me, I'll do some Jesus songs. But they're not going to be Jesus is my boyfriend songs. Right. Nobody yeah. needs any more of those. Oh, God. Jesus oh, is my boyfriend, the only one who cares. I want to sit behind him in math class and comb his pretty hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, What's man. Up? Dr. Seuss is in the house. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm in like a madman. Uh-huh. I'm in like a madman. So maybe well, it's kind of like that, you know. There's so many. It's like the music that I do. I don't. I mean, I write about my relationship with God, and that's as bumpy on my end as is it going to get with anybody else. You know what I mean? I mean, I got a lot of faith, but when I write stuff, I, I'm writing about the reality of my life, not happy, shiny people. You know, that R.E.M. was making fun of when they wrote that stupid song. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, know, I mean, yeah, you know, I just. And I think I think that uh, if you write what's in your heart and the idea is, is that you want to just give. It's like the difference be- between being like a cop with a flashlight and they pull you over and they're like, you've been drinking, son. And being just like a, a lighthouse, just a beacon. And people are drawn to it because it's something different. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I've got a lot of ideas in my head. When I was on stage, I was a real actor. And um, and and I want to be a really uh, flamboyant 
um, trippy, uh, trippy singer. I mean, like I had this dream and I, and I was backstage getting ready. I was putting on like makeup, you know, like stage makeup to highlight your features, you know, like they do. And, yeah. and I was putting on the stage makeup and I had a suitcase full of wigs and it was a different wig for every song, you know, and a different outfit uh-huh. for every song. So I want to be like that, but I'm going to do like the Catholic cross sign a lot and thank God a lot. Yeah. When I'm out there between yeah. songs, you know, and uh, I had this experience speaking of something like that, like you're talking about. Uh, and it was when and I don't want to I I'm, don't want to take the light off of what you're talking about. But uh, last week I preached at the uh, Nashville Rescue Mission and uh, the Lord was really leaning on me hard about it wasn't just the sermon, this book I'm writing, uh, this section is in it. And it's called uh, Not Taking the Path of Least Resistance. It's basically not trying to avoid friction in your life, but embracing it for change. And uh, and so, I mean, he was just like, dude, all you do is duck all the time. You're just looking to stay out of trouble. You don't want to work. You don't want to this. You don't want to do that. And you're not going to grow if you don't do something about it. And And so I was like, I need to write this down. I need to get this clarified. And so, you know, my mom, all the time when I was growing up, she was like, oh, you're always just taking the path of least resistance. And that stuck in my head big time. You should do a song called that. And uh, um, yeah. oh. and so I write this outline, and, and, the, and the title of the sermon, if you're going to title it, was, uh, it was like taking the easy way or being transformed. And so I talked about that. And at the end, you know, it was really, really weird because I practically got a standing ovation, right? And I didn't know what to do. It's like you're talking about. You put on the makeup and you do the theatrics and and you're getting somewhere and you want – you're not trying to bring glory to yourself. You're trying to do something that's really artistic so that people will get it. It's an expression of true creativity. And, you know, and and believe it or not, for people out there – the the good sermons that you hear are the ones where they're being an artist. They're not changing the word of God, but their presentation and, and the way they bring it is like a beacon and stuff. And God must have just done something that night because, for one thing, they had a whole lot of guys, which was really unusual for that day of the month and that day of the week. And all I could do, I could not think of anything else but to just point up to Jesus and just, I'm like, it's not me guys, you know? And it's like Dude. you were talking about doing the sign of the cross, those clues, those things to glorify God, because ultimately that's what it's all for. Ultimately for believers, Dude. that's what it's all for. And, and I was so taken aback by the moment. That's all I knew what to do. I was just like, just praise God, you know? And I pointed up and, and hopefully people in the audience weren't thinking, well, he thinks he's number one. <laughs> Dude, you just gave me a whole nother um, thing in my in my um, arsenal of uh, artistic perform stage craft. Pointing cool. up, pointing up, this, doing the cross yeah. on my chest and pointing up. Yeah, dude, <laughs> and looking up. If you look up and point up, then they won't think that you're saying you're number one. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you if you can find it, and I did look up. Look up. And I was point just up. like I looked up and I shook my head, and it was just like. Glorify God, because I'm as guilty as every person sitting in here, and these are his words. They're not mine. You know, I, I don't take credit for any of it, because he just does what he does, and I get to get in the middle of it. But it's like that. It's We just have to. And one of the things that got me cranked up on that concept was when I was in the Air Force, I was in a band called Fat Cat. And it was spelled P-H-A-T because I guess we were cool like that. And it was a rhythm, rock, and blues, classic rock band. And it, the band had four Christians in it, and yet all we did was secular music. And it, and it bothered me. I, was, I joined the band right at its last six or eight months of existence. I helped them rec- record a demo. And, uh, and the other guitar player they had in the band at the time was an alcoholic. And they were like, well, we got to cut this dude loose. Do you want to play? I thought, yeah, sure. So I had to learn a ton of songs and stuff. 
And uh, finally, we I got him to start doing some of my originals, and it was prog rock, and it was Christian lyrics. I mean, and by Christian lyrics, I mean if you listen to it, you're going to know either you need to talk to God or you're going to want to run from God in the sense yeah. that I wanted it to carry conviction. And so the songs, again, are about my relationship with God. One of the songs was uh, just when I think I'm too far gone, you come and carry me. And, and that was wow. like one of the lines in the lyrics. Yeah, and it, and it was like steps in the sand. Yeah, and so we're we're playing in this place, doing this prog rock tune, and uh, th- all these drunk people are just hearing it, you know, and they don't know it, but we're standing up there actually finally doing Christian music and making a difference. And uh, people liked it. I mean, they, they were drawn to it. There's something about the wooing of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to draw people close that is amazing. And you have to have such a hard heart and closed mind to not respond to him relationally. I, I mean, it's just amazing that way. You know, when I was in the guard and um, there was some kind of conviction, you hear the words that in there and there is nothing, there's nothing there that points you in the wrong direction. I right. mean, I've gone through all, over all the lyrics of all the songs and you can tell I was on this like spiritual journey toward Jesus and I think if I could give some if put somebody else on that same journey maybe through the lyrics and through my performance uh-huh. I mean you're talking about something that's more direct yeah in a way I in hope way, I can get there maybe at you know some because point. I didn't stand up there and sing you better come to Jesus or <laughs> you know Jesus is coming for you or nothing like that all I said were things like just when I think I'm too far gone, you come and get, you know, come and carry me. And just when I think I'm too lost, you come and find me. And it, those were the the words. And it, you know, it's like a love song. I mean, yeah, it was it, just a, an understanding of my frailty. I'm just, I am so weak. I I am weak, and I am afraid of change. And I do have problems with taking the path of least resistance and working hard for the things that I need to work hard for. I yeah, always I mean, yeah. take stuff that goes easy. Yeah. You know, we're talented. You're oh, yeah. talented. I'm talented. The people in our audience are talented. They listen and, and they think of things and they're creative. And the thing is, is that if you don't do the work, it won't, it won't work. Yeah. You got to put in the work, you know, um, being cre- being made in God's image. I mean, a lot, a big part of that is that we also create. Right. You know, exactly. And, God, one, one know, of the reasons God created us, I believe, it's my personal belief, is that he create one of the reasons he created us is to watch us create. Oh, I don't doubt that one bit or we wouldn't have been given that attribute. Yeah. I mean, think about it. When when God came down and told Adam, all right, buddy, I want you to name the animals. That was a creative thing. Oh, yeah. To look at an animal and then say it's it's named. Yeah. And I don't know what Adam called an elephant. I don't, but he called it something. Yeah. You know what I mean? And in in his creative act, he... He called it a heffalump. Heffalump, yeah. (laughs) And uh, so he was, you know, stuffle up, I guess. And and so he was very much like in the same way that God created all those animals and could have named them all himself because he had authority and dominion. Yeah. But he handed that down to Adam and he said, I'm going to give you this much authority. I'm going to let you name my creation. Yeah. And it gives him this project. And wow. I heard somebody talking about it one time, and they were like, if you think about all the species that are on the earth right now and how many species of animals that Adam had to deal with, he was probably naming animals for at least 100 years. Oh, yeah, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a, a whole lot bunch, of them. And he wasn't yeah. naming them like Frank, like George Foreman, you know, what? George, what? George, Look, George, I mean, George. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people think that, uh, they bit into the forbidden fruit right around age 30. But what if they were in that garden for 10,000 years? I, You know, nobody can really say. I mean, after the creation story. What if they know, were in the garden for a million years with God before they ate that apple? It just, it depends on how you look at the scriptures about when Satan was cast down. 
Yeah, but we don't really know that exactly what year it was that Satan was cast no. down. <laughs> no, we no. don't. All I can do is, is I think about me and my hot wife, sinless and, and happy, and uh, God telling me, well, stay away from that. My wife's pretty hot, too. Here's a shout-out to Laura. Hey, Laura. Hotness, baby. Oh, yeah. Uh, my my grandpa Ooh. saw her when we first got married. He, 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 he walks in, sees her for the first time. He comes up to me and he goes, oh, my God, Johnny. <laughs> that reminds me of when I took pictures of my wife. Before she was my wife, I took them home from college in Kentucky. I went back down to Florida. And, and I, they were like, so you got a girlfriend? I was like, yeah. And I took this picture out. And they're like, dude, how did that happen? I know. The, my dad used to say that. You know, I, I'm not that pretty. But I'm telling you what, when I was a teenager, I had the most beautiful girls Yep, including my wife. She was totally gorgeous, Victoria's Secret supermodel. And but uh, my dad used to say, "How? What is it about you?" I used to say, "Dad, if you figure it out, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't crush the mojo, bro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't crush don't it. tell me. <laughs> I don't want to know." <laughs> but uh, yeah, hey, that thing about um, Adam. Um, I have this like little theory. I have all kinds of weird theories about about Jesus and about the Bible. And one of my theories on that, just off, it's totally off the rails, is uh-huh. that you know it, it says that he, that among the animals that Adam couldn't find a suitable helpmate. Right. One of the things I think God was doing, and this is like a weird personal theory of mine, is that he was testing Adam to see if any of the animals turned him on. No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think so. I think so. I don't. Because he had to, because he was looking for a suitable helper and none of the animals qualified. So then he made, then he made Eve. I don't think so. Okay. Well, I I think that, you know, I could be wrong. I I am sure that Adam (laughs) knew. How this was supposed to be. Well, he'd never and seen he a woman before. Was, it was him and God. He'd never seen and a woman before, though. And God was trying to find but, a suitable helpmate. Well, that help was the mate. thing is, is that he could look at himself and see that he looked a certain way and that the male and female of all the other species looked like each other. So he could assume that his mate ought to look like him some, somehow. Okay, well, I'm probably wrong. I've got a lot of wild theories, though. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm not trying to beat you down. That's no, okay. Shoot me down. <laughs> you know, one of the things is that we have to remain joyfully teachable. Dr. Future told me that. I think that is a fantastic, fantastic position to take. Yes. Joyfully teachable. We have to remain joyfully teachable. We cannot get – we cannot pick some weird thing and stand on it like it's a concrete mountain. We yeah, have you can't to, build a church on most stuff people no. think. Uh, but we have to stand on the core. You cannot yep. waver from the core. Jesus is God. He came in the flesh. He died for our sins, and he rose from the dead. Yep. That On that, you will not sway me. Well, it's kind of like the confession of Peter, you know. You're the Christ, the son of the, you're, you know, the, son of the living yeah. God. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And... Uh, and Jesus and said, this is what I'll build my church on. This is what I'll build my church on. Yeah. That exactly. truth that and Jesus was the Christ, not, not Peter, the confession. And the greatest Jesus movie of all, the greatest Jesus actor. What was his name in 1977? He was cool. The guy with the glowing blue eyes. Um, oh, I don't know. Uh, I can't man. say his name. Uh, oh, I when can't you say, say his... When you say glowing blue eyes, all I can think of is Muad'Dib. Muad'Dib. He was almost <laughs> like Muad'Dib. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a they little used Dune the, uh, reference for everybody. The, uh, oh, the Dune the, uh, reference with the glowing blue eyes, the the Fremen. Yeah, they, but we're we're like going stupid off track. So in seventies, <laughs> there was a Jesus who had blue eyes. Yeah, everybody think of me. Let me know his name because I I just I just saw that whole Jesus movie and yeah, and that one part they did it really well and they made sure it's like they really wanted to make sure that the message was on that confession. I'll build my church, and it yeah. made it. They made it really clear, and I was like, whoa. Yeah, you know, it's not about Peter. It's about that statement. You know, a lot of people say, well, they're going to build the – Jesus said he was going to build his church on the rock of Peter. Because Peter, Petra, that means rock. Yeah. But it's not – but it's not – it wasn't built on Peter. 
Jesus really was saying that he was going to build it on that foundation that he was the Christ, the son of the living God on that. Yeah, of course belief. he's going to build it on himself. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, but you it know. looks like he's building it on Peter. But because if you really said, look at the flesh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And so if that's the case, then flesh and blood is not the vehicle that it's going to occur. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, Paul said that Jesus to the, to the unbelievers, it's complete foolishness because these things are spiritually discerned. Right. I don't know if I took that the right way, but I gave it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I gave it a shot. I give it a shot. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually to, looking the verse up. I was going to say I'm going to look. I'm going to look at the Greek real quick. Okay. Well, and, while you and, do that, I'll go back to what I was going to blab about. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, it's the end of my story here. I wanted to tell the end of my story. Absolutely. So anyway, a big part of this was um, a flashback to a show I did with Rabbi Mike. Um, maybe must have been almost a year ago. Maybe maybe nine months ago. Anyway, Rabbi Mike was talking about when they're like on the when he's doing the, you know, Passover and stuff, and they really get into it. He starts to feel holy, and it's a wonderful thing. And I thought back through my life then, you know, the instant flashback because I've never I was like, have I ever felt holy? And it hit me really hard like a ton of bricks. Um, the only time in my life I've ever felt truly holy was at this was in was at the side of Cookie Crane while he was playing his 12-string 12, 12 double neck, you know, like Jimmy Page. Yeah. We were writing a song called uh, Rock in the Hard Place, and we were down in Cookie Crane's rehearsal studio with me and Snake and Cookie, and um, the words went, um, And as dust is gathered on the... I'm not really singing it. Floor... Of the millions of people living out their lives in the dark times, caught between a rock and a hard place, caught between a rock and a hard place, um, caught between, in between, and then it goes, it's like really loud, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place. I can't do it like then, but so you have to forgive me. But then all of a sudden everything went really quiet and Cookie's playing his 12 string really quiet. And I'm going in between, in between it all, right between. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And right there, I mean, when we're, oh, I felt holy set apart. On some kind of a mission. I wish I could sing it right. Um, when I'm back in practice again, you know, when, I, when I'm able to sing again. Because I can't sing unless I've been singing in rehearsals for yeah. a few months. So I'm all out of tune right now. But, yeah, I'll try to sing it for you with the music behind it. And But, dude, I felt like holy then and set apart. And that's been a whole huge part of this whole dream recently. Because... There you go. There it is. So that's the end of my story. There you go. Da dun dun dun. <laughs> da da dun. No, we gotta do da, 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 hard rock in. Dun. Da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> thing is, <laughs> it's really cool to hear. Dun dun. Yeah. Dun. 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 Anyway, I've got like a what at the end of the sacred stone here. Oh, uh, where is it here? Is that it? No, that's not it. That's where we're going. Okay. Where we go. Here we go. Well, let's see if we can find this right here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Here we go. I'll play it. Hey, it's your boy Johnny here in the studio with a little edit note. Um, right after this, we lost, like, I don't know what, 10 minutes of the recording. I hit the wrong button or something, but okay. So Counselor Mark breaks in right here. And it's like it says, in, you know, in Scripture in Romans 12, depending on the, the translation you're reading, you know, some of it says, you know, uh, you know, I'm trying to get it in my head real quick. But basically there's a, pa a one that says, you know, uh, make yourselves a living sacrifice. And then it says, which is your reasonable service? And so you read that and you read it and reasonable and you're just like, that means that it, it's perfectly legitimate, logical, 
acceptable, and to not do it would be to do something that is not logically or reasonably acceptable. Reasonable means it's fully capable. You can do this thing through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's and, and so, you know, get the prayer, get the vision, seek the Lord, do the work. That's what it takes. You have to do the work. Yeah, you really do. <clears throat> you know, a dream, a dream is only a dream until you get down and do that work. You know, yep. you know uh, a lot of people think when they say, when they hear the phrase, let go and let God, that's not doesn't mean anything like um, let go and just sit around and let God do things. It means let go of your pride, let go of your own, you know, yourself, your your lusts, your yeah. everything. Put off the flesh. Off the flesh. Just let go and let God. Let God come into your heart. Let God come into your spirit. Let Jesus change you from the inside out rather than you changing and part of that, I think, you know, there's work involved in that, I believe. I mean, I'm I'm not a monergist. I'm a synergist. So I believe that, you know, there's part uh, – You I mean, you've got to, you know, you've got to try to act like a decent person. I don't know. Yeah. You've got to train. <laughs> you yeah. know, you've got to train. And, you, and you've got to have right motives and, and uh, you've got you gotta, you gotta, you gotta to get your head together in the Lord. You know, you've got to be doing what what's obedient, and and you've got to be seeking Him, and not just you know out chasing waterfalls. So it's just <laughs> <laughs> little precious has a natural temptation. Wait, <laughs> upset Don't for God. temptation, but he just can't see. She give him nothing that his body can't handle. But all he can say is, baby, it's good to me. <laughs> Don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, boy, I did that one pretty lousy. My voice is breaking apart now. Yeah, Johnny wants to be a singer, and he can't even do that. I got a ways to go now to get back into the groove. I'm going to tell you what, man. You so. will. You will. Did you catch my message? I did, man. My, Counselor Mark, he's got to cut out. He's got stuff he's got to do. We've come to the end of our session. All right, yeah. everybody. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bring, it. Bring it. Oh, yeah. Bring it. I got to pop up my secondary machine to usher us yeah, out. Man. I got to tell gotta you gotta what. Start working on the, working the, outro. On the outro, outro. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was going to say, oh, dear. 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 Oh, oh there it is. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. La, 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 Thank, I want to thank Bruce Collins. The Iron Show is on the Fringe Radio Network at the behest of Bruce Collins. I want to thank producer Rick Hendrickson of the Fringe Radio Network. That's FringeRadioNetwork.com. If you want to find our uh, past shows, our posts, download this session later. Download the other live shows. Iron Show Live. Go to Fringe Radio Network slash category slash iron. That's Fringe Radio Network slash category slash iron. I want to thank Peter Goodgame and Dr. Future for early inspiration. I want to count. I want to thank Counselor Mark for being here with us. Oh yeah! Give us one more, Counselor. One, two, three. All right, here it comes. You ready? Are you ready for it? You ready for it? Oh yeah! All right. All right, man. Hey, you know I want to thank you for hanging out with us, and uh, we got more Iron shows coming up, baby. Rabbi Mike is coming back. We're going to have Council Mark coming back. we got all kinds of fights, all kinds of people scheduled. So until next time, remember, man, Johnny loves you.